I'm Josh. I'm working on my PhD in Islamic studies. My areas of interest are Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. I'm Charlie. I've danced also with cocaine bandits in Colombia, surfed across the border into Mexico, and I have a master's in applied linguistics. I'm Nate. I grew up in Bolivia. My specialty is radical Shia politics. I've edited a book on Hezbollah, and I've had tea with some of the wealthiest men in the Middle East. We surf, dodge bullets, and we go to the ends of the earth for the sake of adventure. You can call us Black Box. When we first started out on the trip, there was a lot of logistics that had to be worked out. Most people were fleeing the country. The airport had been bombed, and most uh, access roads had been shut off. So we basically had to track down a guy who knew the back roads and rural areas well enough to get us through. And then uh, we made it to Saida early the next morning when the bombing was done. And when we got to Saida, we saw some pretty gnarly stuff because that had been hit as well. Black smoke, the kind of the, the black smoke that we saw during the entire time we were in Lebanon was rising from the city and it never stopped. You could see it from miles and miles away. It was in the oil refinery right on the coast. It was choking off the fuel for the entire country. There was mile-long lines for gas stations to get gas. People couldn't get gas, they wanted to leave the country. The first time we filled up, it was no big deal. Like, at that point, the gas crunch hadn't started to choke the whole country yet, but it got progressively where they'd only give you a little bit, and then you had to wait in long lines to get a little bit. The main strategy of hitting the oil reserves of Lebanon was just a practical blockade. Choke the country into giving in to the knuckling under of Hezbollah to just close it down, choke out the whole country. Behind the gates of the oil refinery, you see palm trees from blowing in the wind. They're just covered in soot and, and oil and, you know, just thick black smoke and flames. It's pretty crazy. So, uh, here with the local, you said that the, the tank reservoirs were bombed about 15 days ago. We're about seven miles north of Saida, and uh, talking about the bridge that was bombed as well. So this was one of the first targets. Obviously, all the refueling, kind of the, the pinch that everybody's feeling now, uh, was one of the first targets that Israel, Israel had when they first started bombing. So that if everyone's running out of gas and the whole country is choked in the stranglehold of a blockade, then the idea was, you know, Hezbollah would lose support all over, which actually didn't end up happening. First of all, I want to say hello for American people. Big difference between the people and the government. In Arab countries too, big difference in the, between the people and the government. I want to say something for you American people. You are very nice. I live in California. I live in Bill Garden. I have business. I know many, many, many people in America to say, to say here, come here, in the camera, this American people, oh, I love him. Thank you. The problem always with the government. We not support Hassan Nasrallah because he's Hassan Nasrallah, no. We support Hassan Nasrallah because he defends for us. It came out later in the war that the hospitals were down to seven or eight days of electricity left, which is you know, crucial for running all of their medical instruments, whatever, because they run off gas generators. So the fuel supply was not only knocking out transportation, but also you know, infrastructure of every kind. In addition to the transportation disaster and the electricity shortage, the oil spill caused a huge environmental disaster. So come on down and check out the waves. This is the Mediterranean. Here's your fish. If you, if you think the Middle East is locked in the desert and conflict there has nothing to do with the rest of the world, 
nothing they can do because the entire country is blockaded from the air and the sea. There's no cleanup has been allowed, no even efforts at any cleanup or containment of this spill because of the Israeli blockade. So we're just looking at an environmental disaster that's just going on and on and on. I mean, it's a bigger deal because it's the Mediterranean Sea. You just, you can't write it off as an Israel, Lebanon, Arab, you know, whatever problem. This is the same Mediterranean that is, you know, it's in Greece, Italy, it's, it's Ibiza, it's French Riviera, you know, this is, this is all one sea and you got a big freaking gnarly oil spill going on and people are like, yeah, you know, whatever. We'd surfed it a bunch of times in the past. It's beautiful and I mean, when there's storms, there's great waves. It's gorgeous and just to see it like a big thick cesspool of grossness it was depressing. The oil spill is going to cause damage for many years to come, not only environment, all the fish and all the sea life, all that's not going to recuperate for a super long time, but it has real direct repercussions on Lebanon's economy because it's tourism, beach resorts, high-end beach resorts aren't going to be able to open up because nobody wants to go swimming anymore.